Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 8, and this is Session 43. And as you can tell, uh, in uh, Session 43, we're going to be talking about the Song of Moses. Now, the reason that we're looking at the Song of Moses is because we've been in Romans 10, and Paul quotes out of that. Now, why in the world does Paul quote out of Deuteronomy chapter 32? Are we just going to make that rhetorical? And, and, okay. Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. Okay. <laughs> Look, we, Paul, we, we were looking at, and we haven't finished it, looking at Deuteronomy chapter 32, the song, what is called there, the song of Moses. Why in the world are we looking at that in Romans 32? Because Paul quoted it in Romans chapter 10. Here's my question to you. Why is Paul quoting that in Romans chapter 10? Because it's a rebuttal to their question. Ah, thank you, thank you. Because... In Romans chapter 9, you remember there were some objections that were being made. And who was making the objections in Romans chapter 9? That was the believing remnant. The believing remnant of Israel. Because God is talking about... Uh, God. Paul is talking about God interrupting what he was doing with the prophetic program with Israel and now beginning to do something else. And so the believing remnant had some objections about that. They wanted to know, well, how long is this going to go on until he comes back and does our program again? In fact, the big question was, has he replaced us? Is he ever coming back? Is he ever going to do this? So Paul takes chapter 9. In fact, we could just say, I know what verse 1 is, but we could just say from uh, verse 1 to... To, uh, I'm sorry, 1-1 one, one to 29. That's what he's dealing with. He's dealing with those objections. Then, when you get into Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 33, now he's going to talk about why Israel, excuse me, is in the condition they're in. Because they did something in response to their own Messiah. Prior to the cross... Look, prior to the cross, right here, they rejected Him, right? Alright, so they rejected Him. But then, when you get to Romans 9, 30 and 33, He's not talking about the rejection prior to the cross. He's talking about the rejection after the cross under the administration of the Holy Spirit who came in Acts 2. And what happens in Acts 1 through 8? Uh, uh, all right, but, in, but, but in, what, what do we call Acts 1 through 8? Huh? The extension of mercy. And in that extension of mercy, as, as Jesus himself said during his earthly ministry, that he was going to give Israel one more year. And in that year, they were given three big opportunities to change their mind about Jesus being the prophesied Christ of Israel. So in the extension of mercy, we're still in Israel's program here. And so in Romans 9, 30 to 33, what does Paul say Israel did when they were confronted with Jesus out there in that extension of mercy? They did what? Well, what's the word? I'm, I'm, they did reject him, but what's the word Paul is using here? Yes, thank you, Barbara. He, they, that, that is they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Now remember first when he talks about the rejection before the cross, he says, have you never read that the stone which the builders rejected, that's what took place here. What happens after that? God says, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone. That's what happened here. So there's the rejection, 
And then they get confronted. We've got to deal with that issue one more time. And those who reject him, they stumbled. And when you stumble, what may happen? You fall. The stumbling and the fall of Israel. So God interrupts at the end of that extension of mercy, interrupts that program, starts now the mystery program. He starts putting together from Jew and Gentile, the church, the body of Christ, and all of that. So now when you get into Romans chapter 10, and you start in verse 1, what does verse 1 say? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Because here's the thing, they may have rejected him prior to the cross, they may have rejected him again in the extension of mercy, but God in his long suffering is giving the same people who rejected him twice another opportunity to be saved now, not as part of the believing remnant of Israel, but now as part of the body of Christ, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile. They're going to get another opportunity to be saved. Long suffering and mercy of God. Now, in Romans chapter 10, he is now, because Romans 9 dealt with objections, Romans 10 is going to deal with some objections again. But this time the objections, the objections are raised by whom? Okay, uh, give me a broader title, not just the religious leaders of Israel that... But this is going to, this is going to be in, anyone who is in this unsaved Israel or part of the apostate nation. Because now they're going to say, the reason we didn't get saved is not our fault. We didn't believe in Jesus. That's not our fault. That's God's fault. They're going to put the fault on God. Remember, turn with me in your Bible, if you would just so that we see this, and, and this will catch us right up to where we are. In Romans chapter 10, if you realize what's going on there, he says in verse 1, I want Israel to be saved. Verse 2, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, he said they are ignorant of God's righteousness. In what way? Because they're going, out, going about to establish their own righteousness. And how were they doing that? How were they trying to be righteous? Yeah, by keeping the law. That's how they were trying to do it. You know what the problem with that is? You can't do that. Because in order to be justified by the law, here's the only thing that's required. Perfection. Because when you sin in one, guilty of it all. So you, and, and, and Paul will talk about that issue. You want to be saved by your works? It's pretty easy to understand, not to do. All you got to do is be perfect. Because that's the minimum requirement. Perfection. Not, so what is everybody's excuse? Well, I go, well, I'm, I'm better than Kim. Well, but see, God's not looking at, she's not the standard. He's looking at a perfect standard which is why we have to have His perfect righteousness imputed to us when we trust Jesus Christ. All right, now, now, look in verse, in chapter 10, we can come on down, but I want to get down here to these objections because they're going to say, um, I mean, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. But then when you come on down here, um, look at uh, verse 13, because remember we divided this thing up into into two sections. The first section, 1 through 13, that really wasn't the objections. Here's what he's talking about. He's talking about for Israel to be saved. But when you get into uh, verses 14 and, uh, I'm sorry, 14 and onward, now you begin to see these objections. And, and so let's just read through it, and that'll give us a context for where we are. Uh, verse 14. Well, uh, just back up 1 to 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But here's what unsaved Israel says, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So they're saying, look, you're holding us accountable to be saved. Remember, this, whosoever shall 
call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they'll say, how are we going to call on someone in whom we have not believed? But it doesn't end there. Keep reading in that verse. And it says, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? The first objection, I think I have it on the PowerPoint. The first objection is, God didn't send us anybody to tell us. You're holding us accountable for believing in Him, for calling on the name of the Lord. How shall we call on Him in whom we have not believed? And how shall we believe in whom we have not heard? God didn't send any preachers. Is that true? Paul's going to demonstrate that's not true. But this is the objection. It's not our fault we didn't believe. God didn't send anybody. And then if we read the rest of the verse, and it says, and, and, and how shall they hear without a preach? So there, you see what they're saying? It's not our fault. We didn't call on him because we didn't believe in him. But we didn't believe in him because we didn't hear about him. And we didn't hear about him because God didn't send any preachers. How shall they hear without a preacher? And then what is Paul going to do? He's going to come along and say, oh, you guys are wrong. He sent plenty of preachers. And he's going to talk about it. So then, like everybody else, instead of going, you know what, Paul, you're right. It's our fault. No. No. So when Paul does that, they go, okay, okay. He sent preachers. Does anybody remember the second objection? Yeah. Their message wasn't clear. We, didn't, we couldn't get it. We couldn't understand it. Did they understand it? <laughs> they, they, yeah, they stoned them. Did they stone them because they didn't understand what they were saying? Remember what Jesus said? He did all these miracles and they took up stones to stone him. And he said, for which of these miracles do you stone me? And they said, oh, we're not stoning you because you did a miracle. We're stoning you because you made yourself equal with God. So they did understand the message, didn't they? They understood exactly what the message was. So Paul demonstrates, oh, you guys absolutely. So here's the second one. The message of those preachers is unclear. But in 15, 16, and 17, the objection is going to be there. And Paul's going to say, oh, no, you did understand. You did. So now, back to the third objection. And here it is. Well, okay, God sent some preachers, and we did understand what they said. But, not all of us got to hear about it. Only a few of us got to hear. And Paul is going to say, not true. And you know what we learn from what Paul says about this? Because now he's going to quote out of Psalm 19. And he is going to demonstrate to them that in the Jewish community, not just in Israel, but around the world, they all got to hear about the Messiah. They may not have believed He was the Messiah, but they all got to hear. There wasn't anyone, which is Paul, why Paul says down there when he says, um, uh, let's see, uh, verse 18. Well, I should have looked right there, <laughs> verse 18. But I say, have they, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. You know what? That, that talk about Jesus got out there. They may not have liked it and they may not have believed it, but they absolutely heard it. So that excuse won't work. So where are we now? In excuse number four. They just keep pushing it off, don't they? It's not our fault we didn't believe. You can't, that's unfair for God to hold us accountable. He didn't send anybody. Well, he sent here and here and here and here. Oh, okay. But we didn't understand what they were saying. Yep, you did understand because here was your response to that. Okay, but, but only a few of us heard. No, no, you all heard. You all knew. Find me anybody that didn't know. Remember all those verses went through when it says, And the fame of him went throughout all the country. Over and over. We must have looked at 12 or 14 verses where it talked about that all through his ministry. Now, we're going to get to this verse. That's 18. Now we go to 19. But I say, did not Israel know? So now you have to ask yourself the question, didn't they know what? 
there was something Israel was supposed to know that was part of, remember, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, we couldn't call on him because we didn't believe in him. But the reason we didn't believe in him is because you didn't send a preacher. Or the reason we didn't believe in him is because those preachers weren't very clear. Or the reason we didn't believe in him is because those preachers only told a few of us. And now that all of that's been debunked, now he's going to come along and say, but now this is Paul talking to them, but didn't Israel know? There was something Israel was supposed to know that they could have observed that would make them know that this was the Messiah. So that's what we're talking about. Didn't Israel know? And what is Paul going to do? I'm going to take you right back to how we started the session. He quotes out of the Song of Moses. So here it is. First, Moses saith, he's going to give you two, two answers to this. First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Now, I'm going to do something. By the way, let's just look at it over here. By the way, I, th th this... Now, I'm going to show you two commentators. This is the way it is in almost every commenta commentary. They get both parts of this wrong. Do you know why? Because they cannot rightly divide the word of truth. They cannot differentiate between the programs. And because of that, they come to a wrong conclusion. And that means what Paul is trying to explain here in Romans chapter 10, they will never get it until they come to that knowledge. So look, here it is. Here's Mr. Abbott, a well-known commentator. A lot of folks have his commentaries. Here's the verse, did not Israel know? And then here's his comment, and I didn't leave anything out. Did they not know that the favor of God, which they rejected, was to be bestowed on the Gentile nations? Now here's what I'm going to say. No, they didn't know that. Do you know why? They weren't told that. Nowhere in the Old Testament did God ever say to them, I am going to reject you and go to the Gentiles. But I can show you dozens of places where God says, even though I, you're no longer my people and I'm no longer your God, in the same place that I said that, I will again say, you are my people and I am your God. In other words, they may come to that place in their history where God puts them under the courses of punishment, but at the end, he never said, I'm replacing you. Does anybody remember where that was? Just give me a second. I shouldn't do this here. I, I, I just shouldn't do this here. But we've covered it. It's in your notes. We went over those and over those. How that God, even though the prophet was pronouncing all this judgment upon them, he says, but at the end, I'm going to return unto you. Remember, God gives Israel a bill of divorcement. But remember what he says, was it Hosea? I will allure you and bring you into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And, 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 and you know what he's talking about? Yeah, you may be going through this now, but at the end, this is what I'm going to do. So Mr. Abbott, did they not know? No, the, answer, the reason he thinks that's true is because he doesn't know who is being identified here. And the only thing he can look at is the gospel went to the Gentiles today. So he's thinking that must be what they didn't know. Now, in order to get that out of their scriptures, he's going to have to misidentify somebody. Because where for the first time was it revealed to anybody the secret of what God had hidden from the foundation of the world about what he was going to do with Gentiles in this dispensation of, of grace? Who's the first person God ever revealed that to? Paul. So Moses didn't know it. Because if he did, it wasn't a secret hidden from the foundation of the world. It was written in their scriptures. It was ridiculous. So, Mr. Abbott, in order to prove it, he goes this. Them that are no people, he says, that's the Gentiles. And a foolish nation, 
He says that's a people despised, which is the normal nomenclature that the Jews used to describe the Gentiles. Well, I'm not, I'm not debating that they didn't despise the Gentiles. My objection is with the fact that Deuteronomy 32 is actually talking about that. I don't, I don't believe that at all. So let's move to the next one here. Romans 2. Uh, well, wait. I'm sorry. Oh. Because I was going to say, there's a context to these things that Paul is doing in Romans chapter 10. The context is not about the dispensation of grace. And by the way, even today, we're not replacing Israel. We're a whole nother program to accomplish a whole nother purpose. And Paul is going to tell us before he gets out of chapter 10 and use all of chapter 11 to say to you, but don't get high-minded and thinking you've replaced these guys that stumbled and I interrupted what I was doing with them because one day your program's going to come to an end and then I'm going to go back and finish what I started with them. There's going to be a lot of preachers with red faces of embarrassment because it was plainly written in the Word. All right, so... There, there that is, in, in 15, he says, how beautiful, because when he says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? See, that was their saying. See, God, you didn't send us any preachers. That's the problem with us. You know, Frank, I was telling everybody here, for years, everybody used this and put it on missionary banners. How shall they preach? The, the real thing that's sitting in there is, <laughs> Paul's not holding a missionary conference He's answering objections of Israel's excuses for why they rejected Jesus. That's what that is. But anyway, anyway, so he says, here's how you should have responded. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of priests and bring glad tidings of good things. Who's he quoting there? Isaiah. In other words, he said, you know what? If you guys were looking at this the way you should have looked at it, those preachers that I did send, you would have said, Man, we've been waiting for you guys to bring us glad tidings. Thank you! But no. No. Total rejection of those guys. So here it is in Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord shall what? Bring again Zion. Bring, break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places, places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted His people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. I have a question for you. Does that look like He replaced her with Gentiles to you? That's what Paul was just quoting. Does that look like it? Anybody look in there and, and say, yep, I read that and I just knew God was going to replace them with Gentiles. You've got to be kidding. There's no reference to Gentiles in there. But that's modern day commentators. That's how that goes. I give you Isaiah 8 because he's talking about this same issue at the beginning of his book. Bind up the testimony Seal the law among my disciples. Do you know who's speaking here? The L-O-R-D. Do you remember when David said this? And the, I need to start over here. The capital L, capital O, capital D. The Lord said unto my, capital L, small O-R-D, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Identify for me who the capital, all caps Lord is. That is Jehovah. That's the I am. Who is this? The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand. Who's sitting at the right hand of the Father? you got two members of the Godhead right here. I'm telling you, this member of the Godhead, which is the Son, that's who said, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, 
and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, look, I and the children whom the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D gave me. I and the children. In other words, it's like the son saying, me and the children that my father gave me. Everybody with me here? are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord, capped, all caps, of host, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Does that look to you like God's replacing them with Gentiles? No, he's talking about the, by the way, I put that up there because that's the preachers when they said they, you didn't send anybody. He said, if you'd have been reading back in Isaiah, you'd have known good and well who to look for. And you would have said, how beautiful are, them, are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But you guys didn't want to do that. So, um, this is going to bring us down to identifying the rest of that verse. The foolish nation. Um, so what I'm trying to show you as far as we read this is the context of Romans 10 right here is not talking about God replacing Israel with Gentiles. That's not the context. Because he's quoting there from Isaiah 52. And you can't find that in Isaiah 52. So suddenly to interpret that out of Isaiah 52 is incredibly wrong. And secondly, God never told them he was going to replace them in favor of the Gentiles. By the way, by the way, back up here in Romans chapter 9. Sorry. Remember, that was one of their objections. That was one of the, the believing remnant had. They were asking, is God ever going to come back to us? Is he through with us? Has he replaced us? That, and Paul answered that in chapter 9. The only people who think... God has replaced Israel with us are the people that didn't read chapter 9. He already answered that for the believing remnant. When you get to the unsaved Israel, he's telling them, you say, well, what is he telling them with all this stuff? The reason you're in the predicament you're in is not my fault. It is your fault. I gave you plenty of preachers. The message was clear, and you should have responded to that. And all of you knew, not just some of you. And by the way, didn't you know something? Remember how verse 19 starts out? For I say, did not Israel know? So we're going to get to what it is they're supposed to know. But to do that, we have to restart. So hold on a second. Mark, cut us off, and we'll start the second.